yes, it is very important to do a research, but then I think it's more important to to make an impact from your research. So that means is what messages you wanted to deliver to the people that can benefit from it. Welcome to the Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandy Buzzard, and it's my pleasure to bring you the trending issues and topics with the best and brightest minds of the beef industry. Today, I'm so excited to welcome Dr. E.G. Shong, Assistant Professor and Precision Livestock Management Specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Dr. Shong received her bachelor's at China Agricultural University and her master's and doctorate at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She currently works on applying technology to livestock management systems, and we are so happy to have her here with us. Welcome to the show, Dr. Xiong. Thank you so much, Brandy, and uh, thank you, the Beef Podcast uh, listeners. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, we are really excited to have you and talk more all about um, biological systems engineering and precision livestock technology and, and all sorts of things like that. So just to start off with, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in the beef industry and your career path so far? I know I touched on it just a little bit in the upfront, but if you want to go into more detail or or share anything that you want to expound upon further. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it probably would make better sense if I start with my career path and then like uh, uh, explain how I got involved in beef industry. So great. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like like my education uh, entails that I have a agricultural engineering training. So to a lot of people, that probably means uh, or makes better sense in like a tractor testing or irrigation uh, management. But there is a very small uh, section that uh, that us agriculture engineers are working on improving in trying to control and better provide information and uh, management assistance to the livestock industry. So that being said is I'm just applying the engineering skill set and the mindset to help with the livestock, the animals, and then the housing environment that they interact with. So um, that probably involved when I was a, a small girl that, you know, like we all had a... Uh, uh, as a girl, we all had a dream about animals. And so that kind of guided me uh, to my future career desires. I wanted to do something with animals because, to be honest, animals are way easier <laughs> to, <laughs> to deal with and work with than uh, people. <laughs> That's my excuse. So uh, that, no, kind of, that makes sense. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of got me through. Uh, of course, initially, I wanted to start with something like companion animals, cats and dogs. Um, however, after a few experience and tried and classes taken, I think being a, a, a vet is too challenging for me. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I can handle it. Um, not tough enough to do that. So I kind of back down and see what are other options available for a career path that can allow me to work with animal related, uh, partic particularly livestock uh, related stuff. So, and then the agricultural engineering with a focus on livestock environment management came to sight. And I just signed up and that's how I ended up with my training. Um, then how do I get involved with the beef industry is I think um, the the training and the skill set that I have right now is very universal and very broad. So um, I can work on beef cattle. I can work with pigs. I can work with chicken and some of that uh some of the species I had interacted with the uh, with my graduate studies. So the only thing that I actually haven't spent a lot of time and dive deep into was the beef industry because okay. it was very challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> so when the when the job uh, position announcement. Uh, was made aware for me, like at the Nebraska uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln, 
Right. So I jumped into it and because I felt like not only that I believe my expertise can probably bring benefits to the university, but also Mm -hmm. uh, the beef industry. And it's just a challenge that I wanted to, and and also an area that I want to learn more uh, Mm -hmm. about. So that's how I got involved in the beef industry and my career path. So you're very well rounded. You're you're like a veterinarian that has worked with everything. You've got well, you said chickens and you said pigs and you said cattle and I think you said sheep, right? No? Um not sheep. Well that might be some other opportunity down the road if I can handle the place, uh the stuff on my plate that I can yeah. handle. <laughs> Yeah. But you said, I mean, you've worked with lots of different species, so you're, you know, you're not refined or specialized in just beef. And that's really interesting. I want to talk a little bit more about, you were talking about the biological systems engineering department and that engineering knowledge that you bring. Um, Can you talk more about your work in that department? Any like, are you doing teaching in that department or research or extension or like a little bit of everything? Yeah, so um, I think that's probably a university organization um, question. So, yes, I am doing a little bit of everything there, and I have a minor appointment with the BSE uh, because, first off, I I wanted to have my agriculture engineer hat, so that's kind of an honor. And (laughs) second, um, it allows me to... Uh, advise and direct graduate students uh, from or recruit students from the biological system engineering like without any uh, difficulty so it's it's very convenient and then I got to uh, it also exposed me to both departments so doubled the opportunity and doubled the connection and doubled the um, experience that I can learn from other people and other faculty and other students I've been enjoying this kind of joint appointment a lot. Um, But specifically about what kind of work that I do, I mostly, I think, do research um, and advise students for uh, BSc. And sometimes, like if needed, I do help some of my colleagues to teach uh, guest lectures about some of the emerging technology that are applying or being applied to uh, the beef industry or beef cattle area. What for the for myself and also for our listeners, what is the I'm going to feel really silly for asking this, but what is the BIC? Uh, BSE. Mm-hmm. So it's Biological Systems Engineering. Okay, I just okay, I didn't understand the acronym. No, there's there's Sorry. there's no silly questions, Brandy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, well that I mean that's really interesting, and I you know that you get to combine two things that you really like with the biological systems and the research and the advising. So that's that's really great. Um, in, in something I find another thing I find really interesting is earlier in your bio when you were talking about your career path and and how you got here is you really find animal housing and environmental controls very interesting. So, I mean, can you tell us like, you know, how you got, what interested you in that, I guess, or maybe you've already feel like you've covered that sufficiently, but can you just speak more about that with animal housing, environmental controls, if that's something that your love for that started with maybe pigs or chickens and now it's in beef or just, that's very interesting. And I've never had a guest talk about those things. So I'm very interested. Absolutely. So um, probably to, to ease us in uh, for a better understanding, I'll start with my experience, a very valuable and interesting uh, experience with market pigs. Okay. So um, for my master's degree, what I did is to understand the uh, thermal environment inside of a commercial transport trailer for market okay. pigs. Okay. So uh, if we're not in the in the pig industry, we probably don't know that. But, but really similar to the beef transport uh, industry. So we're facing about like, how do we understand the type of or the kind of environment they are, the animals are experiencing uh, when they're being transported? So that was a that was a study that was funded by the National Port Board and to, just to have further understanding about that. Um, 
so what got me really interested in that in that area is when I had all the data that gathered from like I can't remember it on top of my head, but I think I had about a one hundred twenty sensors for that trailer. Okay, so we wow. Have, yeah, so that's a, a lot, lot of data, <laughs> a lot of sensors for one trailer, two decks, um, and I have all that information gathered and doing all those to a student's a very valuable like statistical analysis and blah blah blah. But then like when I when I bring that data st- statistically uh, different or uh, impact or whatever data that you would make sense to me or a faculty. But when I brought that data to um, the the truck driver that had been helping me for over a year, he's like, well, you did that. That sounds great. That sounds that you're making some work. But you know what? I don't understand any of that. <laughs> and if you buy me a beer for dinner, I'll just call that you did something great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, that kind of brought me to a eye opening moment. Like, okay, so data makes sense to me or to us as researcher, but it's actually not making much sense for the people who really need it. Right, right. And then, so um, how I really dive into this animal housing environment control is like, how can I use the newer or modern sensors and get the data uh, for a representative environment and more importantly, to make them useful or to make them speak to the producers or the workers that I really need that to help them make better decisions about uh, animal production systems, to help with their profit, to help their farm management, and then animal welfare. So all those kind of bigger topics. So that is why I'm really interested in this uh, focus. So... But then, like, we talk about the difference, the significant difference between uh, confined or careful, um, right? like beef or chicken. Mm -hmm. Those, even though they're also hard to manage or monitor, but still, in my opinion, the information is easier to gather than the beef cattle area because we're facing, we're dealing with a lot more extensive uh, environment so that is just bringing another layer of uh challenge but then also some opportunity for me to dive into this area so is it more difficult to uh to control what is a open lot absolutely but are there things we can button monitor and potentially provide Better solutions, absolutely too. So, for example, heat stress, and you can probably uh, better monitor it with some of the newer sensors and newer technologies, and try to try to prevent that from happening, happening, or try to provide some alleviation solutions if that happens. Okay, that, I mean that's really interesting. Um... And you're totally right about being able to control the, you know, the different things. What, what you were saying is really interesting. And I think you're right on, you're, you're right on point with like the importance of the different monitoring levels and, and being able to control the environment. I found it really interesting when you were talking about the data that you were collecting wasn't being received by the people who maybe need it quite a bit. You know, you were talking about the truck driver. Um, he thought that was really cool that you were doing the research, but he couldn't really use the the data in the way that you were presenting it. And I think that's really important across all academia and beef industry and other industries is being able to take the data that we get and develop that into applicable um methods and ways that people can actually utilize it. Because if, you know, if we can't use the the results, then the research is really in vain. So I think that's a really, really great point that, that you brought up. I totally agree, Brandy. And I think that's the responsibility for um, researchers or quote unquote 
effective researchers because yes, it is very important to do a research, but then I think it's more important to to make an impact from your research. So that means is what messages you wanted to deliver to the people that can benefit from it. Is that their job? Um, I don't think so. I think it's more of our job as researchers in academia because first off, we need to understand our audience and especially working in um, livestock area and with an extension appointment is we need to understand who we're targeting and we're trying to deliver the information. And then we need to make sure they understand. Otherwise, the research is probably done, yes. But is it effectively done? Probably not. That was, I caught that you said that there's effective researchers or impactful researchers. Are there some, <laughs> are there some researchers that aren't as effective or impactful than others? Or maybe not researchers themselves, but maybe research as a whole. Is there some research that isn't impactful as I mean, because we know that there is research that is impactful. So, I mean, I guess, is there a lot happening in the in the world that isn't impactful? I, you know, that's a very tricky question. I think for my standards is I always want my research and to be impactful or effective. But uh, there are some research would, and I don't want to offend any of my colleagues, but it's kind of like a workspace, right? Like you sometime um, finish a task and mm-hmm. then you make sure it's carried over. But a lot of all the times and based on people's personality and the way how they work is they would just hit a, a finish line and then they stop right there. So it happens. And to me, that is probably not very effective. Um, and I always use that as a standard to, to encourage myself is to always consider the people that I wanted to serve and that I wanted to make an impact to. I think that was a, I put and, you on the and spot I think, there. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I made up the effective researcher terminology just as we talk about. We no, all okay. want to be impactful and effective. That's for sure. I put you on the spot there. I apologize for that. No, but I, no. I picked up on I thought, oh, I have to ask her about that. But that was a, I feel like that's a great breakdown of that because we all want to, I mean, I, I don't have a, a PhD. I stopped after my master's. I'd had enough. But um, <laughs> I, but, you know, we all, whether we're work whether we have a master's or PhD or we work in industry or, you know, we, we don't have a degree of that nature. Like we all want to know that the work that we're doing matters and that it's helping people or helping the industry or making an impact. And so I think that that's a fair discussion and fair points that you brought up. Absolutely. Um, so I know you said that you have that you're doing research and advising students um, and do a little bit of guest lecturing. Is there one that you prefer over the other? Like, do you prefer research over guest lecturing over advising? Like, Where are you at kind of Could you rank those and in which you kind of prefer the most? Yeah, so I think I can probably uh, share that I, I'll be honest, like advising students bring me the most joy. Oh, great. For a junior faculty that sometimes can also uh, bring me a lot of frustration. (laughs) However, I still enjoy advising students and doing research the most because like I mentioned, like we're talking about impact, uh, impactful communication and information delivery. That is when our research is received and is useful for a producer, then that's very impactful and makes me feel like I'm doing something good. That's great. And then my second, my, my um, other appointment is extension. And I do lecture, uh, guest lecture teaching. However, I don't have a active teaching appointment. appointment. Okay. But um, I think it's good and bad. The good thing is I don't have to be on a fixed schedule. Like okay. um, every week I'm going to teach um, three classes or something like that. That's very time driven, and mm-hmm. sometimes you're, you're you you will find a difficult balance to re, to achieve the yeah. time that you spend on uh, research, advising students, and then teaching. 
Right. So fortunately, I don't have that pressing issue for teaching. Mm -hmm. And however, I do find that extension is very similar. And the difference, the major difference that I see extension is uh, between extension and teaching is extension are facing a different learner uh, or learning group, right? So instead of college students and we're trying to teach or deliver information to uh, beef producers, beef extension educators, or maybe even industry folks or commodity group people. Um, it's really, it has been really enjoyable and I got to do more podcasts like this. So probably I don't <laughs> right. have a lot of opportunity like this if I'm just teaching and then research, right? Right. And I do also think that uh, with an extension appointment or teaching the adult learners, um, and sometimes I also had some exposure to youth extension learners as well, which was really uh, rewarding. And extension learning is probably going to uh, make some impact in a shorter term or okay. investment because as the technology, as the industry moves fast, a lot of people want to be the early adopter for technology and newer stuff. So they probably would try to jump onto something really quick. While teaching on the other side, um, I don't have a lot of teaching experience, so I probably am just uh, thinking out loud. You are making a much longer uh, time investment. So basically you are investing the next generation workforce so it probably won't you probably won't see a tangent um, impact in a year or two we might talk about 10 years and then hopefully the knowledge that you taught the kids can be um, paid back right and they're going to do something really exciting in the beef industry or the crop industry uh, whatever yeah, I think that's really important thing you brought up with the audience. Like you have lots of different audiences and, and it's important for us to, whether you're hosting a podcast or you're giving a presentation or conducting research is to be aware of the audience that you're trying to reach. Yeah. So, you know, like I think it was a coincidence, like right before our podcast and I was just attending a uh, student noon meeting group and one of my colleagues was talking about how to prepare a effective poster and presentation so the key take-home messages is understand who is your audience and what is the purpose of your presentation or poster or podcast or class and then what is in that you have for them to understand to make an impact Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that's one of the first things I think before we do any type of communication is to, again, whether it's a podcast or a paper that we write or anything, is to think about who the audience is because people absorb information in all different ways. And um, yeah, people just learn things in different ways and they accept information, research and data differently. And it's important to keep that in mind, um, you know, as we move forward, whether we're, like I said, you're doing research or I do podcasts and blog posts and things like that. So that's just a really, really um, fair point. And it was not, it's nice to hear, you know, how much you enjoy all the different aspects of your job. Um, That's always really, that's what you want, right? Is to to agree at all. Um, You spoke a little bit about the challenges already of, you know, between, of, of like, if you had a set schedule or of having students, but Do you have any, like, have you run into any specific challenges with research that are unique or just kind of the same challenges that are across all, all kind, like all aspects of academia? That's a very good question. I think um, as researchers, probably a lot of my colleagues would agree with me that getting research funding is very difficult and is becoming more and more challenging. A lot of the uh, grants are calling for very catchy ideas. But then, like, (laughs) at the same time, 
uh, as an engineer, we still want to be uh, applied and very down to earth. So sometimes um, that can be a challenge to get enough funding and then to support the research and to support the students and their tuition. Now, the second challenge, I think, would be, or, or rather than a, a challenge, is just nature is uh, the, the progress would probably take longer right. to uh, finish because not only you're hiring or supporting a student to do the research, but also you are supporting invest- investing them into their uh, education. Mm-hmm. And so imagine like some of the research probably would be done by a R&D uh, research and development division in a company in about six months, but it uh-huh. would take us uh, faculty and students together, like maybe two years to finish degree. <laughs> yes. And then finish like um, their thesis writing because not only you are, you're doing the research, but you're also mentoring and educating uh, the students. And that take a lot of effort and a lot of time, and that brings me the most joy, but sometimes it can be frustrating too and time consuming. Yeah, you're poor. I mean, you're pouring your knowledge and your insight and time into people and whether you're teaching people or you're supervising people. I mean, that that takes takes things out of you from emotionally. I mean, it's also very tiring. So, I mean, I remember being in grad school and thinking, oh, this, you know, it won't take very long. And then things get drug out. I made some lab mistakes and I had to, you know, I made several lab mistakes and then we had to fix those and redo things. And it, it just happens and that kind of stuff. So exactly. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's nice to see you're still, the audience can't see you, but you're smiling as you're talking through these challenges. So it's good that you, you, you enjoy your position, even though there are challenges. Um, you, so we talked about the biological engineering. Um, can you tell us like a little bit about maybe some of your precision livestock management or any of the work that you're doing within that area right now? Can you share any of that? Absolutely. So that is at right at my alley. And I got really excited to talk about my research. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here my we go. Title... <laughs> Here's your platform. Have at it. Yay. So my title is Precision Livestock Management. So I, I wanted to, um, if you already heard this buzzword, uh, so please forgive me to repeat, but I think it's very important to uh to uh, bring up a newer concept or newer buzzword to the audience. So we're on the same page. In the engineering uh, realm, the precision livestock management is a tool that utilizes real-time data on individual animals to aid management decisions. So if I can put that on the slide, what I would highlight are three different words or component of phrases. So first off, the precision livestock management is a tool. And second is it is trying to use real-time data or sometimes I very much argue is near real-time data, okay? But the point is like more timely data than like we can or latent data that we have like two weeks ago or a month ago. And the third one um, is individual animals or smaller herd animals. Mm-hmm. I guess there are there are a force component. So it's to, <laughs> the last important thing is to aid management decisions, right? Because right. I think we, we we kind of discussed a little bit about that. Is if the the tool or the research or the whole uh, buzzword doesn't do any justification to an improved management decision, then I don't think it's very effective or uh, impactful. So those are those are the four different or critical components that form the area of precision livestock management. Okay. And um, some of the work that I'm doing that are kind of interesting, um, I'll just I'll try to not ignore too much, but one thing that I have been really enjoy doing is to use a depth camera or a three D camera to take a uh, over 
uh, what does that say? Like the top view images or top view 3D images、uh, of a calf or of a mature cow or heifer, however you want to. Uh, however, the stage of the of the of the beef beef cattle, and then use that three D images to estimate their dorsal volume, and then correlate that dorsal volume to the、uh, body weight. And also, like we can extract some useful information, for example, the length, and then the width, and then like maybe where their、uh, hip bones are. Those kind of critical information to correlate that with the body condition score for、uh, mature beef cows, and the is very interesting because it has been explored by a lot of other species. For example, the pigs and the、uh, broiler chicken and dairy cattle. And also, like、um, there are probably a more mature technology and application in、uh, countries like European and、uh, Australia, and those 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 areas that have a much higher demand and more confined production、uh, right. mode for、yeah. dairy or beef cattle. However, it is kind of novel for the U.S. beef industry. So my colleagues and I are really looking forward to、uh, publishing some results on that, and by far we are getting some really good correlation and very accurate data、um, than what we could achieve before. So the idea of this is like, for example, yes, if if we are a if our customer or our producers are a big Uh, feed yard or a big、uh, cow calf production system, they have the capacity for having a scale or having a shoot or right, a walking、yeah. alley.、Mm, but it brought to my attention that a lot of the smaller、uh, producers, like we're talking about ten or fifty, those kind of scale, they don't have the capacity or the ability to have a really accurate scale system. So then, if if this is、uh, coming together, then we can probably providing an alternative, alternative but also low cost technology to help them to get a precise and accurate body weight, so that they know their cow's condition or their heifer's condition,、um, etc. So that's one study that got me really excited. Another one is I am helping、um, my colleagues are doing real time GPS positioning for、uh, cattle. Oh, okay. Yeah, and combining that with virtual fencing, that's a lot.、Yeah. That is a very hot topic right now. It is. I've heard about. I mean, I don't know much about it, but I, I've heard it mentioned. Yeah. So, like、uh, the virtual fencing.、Um, I am sure that you heard of like the invisible fence for dogs. Yes, absolutely. I have a dog that.、Uh, yes, we've had to use that before. Yeah. Basically, the same idea.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then the cattle would be putting on a collar that had some instrumentation inside, and it can it can initiate a sound alarm, and then also a a very 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 gentle so.、Uh, The the virtual fence collar would initiate some sound alert and then also very very gentle、uh, electric shock to tell the cows or the the steers that you are entering a unauthorized zone and please turn back. So that's really similar idea than the、uh, the invisible fence for the dogs, right? You don't want them to run away from your house or for your yard.、Um, Now the real time GPS positioning or the virtual fence to me they are just fancy or newer technologies. But what I'm looking for and what I'm getting into is what can they do for、uh, the industry and for the producers. The GPS positioning is useful if you wanted to really keep a close eye on where your um, your uh, cattle are grazing.、Mm-hmm. Right, like you just wanted to know where they are, and you wanted to kind of have a sense of, 
okay, so this GPS spot had to move for a day or two. Um, either that the collar is falling off or that calf is having some difficulties. And then you can actually see that from your computer or your phone and you can just track it down without needing to wander around on a four-wheeler or a horse and trying to find that calf like in hundreds of acres of land. Yeah, that's no fun. I've done no, that. No, <laughs> I haven't all, done it. Yeah, it's not fun. I don't <laughs> recommend that. I like the sound of this better. <laughs> yes, and I've heard of a lot of like uh, either students or employees complain about like, uh, we'll find him or her in about a month later. So that's no good, right? We wanted to- Yeah, we don't want that. Exactly. We want to minimize this from happening. Now, the virtual fence is, again, like, um, it's cool that you don't have to, um, you know, run your cattle by yourself or, or, or build uh, manual fences. But then yeah. with my colleagues' uh, smart ideas and what we believe it can really do is to help the producers and forage managers to better manage their uh, pastures, mm -hmm. know a better time frame to rotate their, uh, their, their herd and rotate their pastures. And then we're really looking into like, how can we use the virtual fence or if, if can we use the virtual fencing to, um, uh, to help assist different grazing management, for example, script, script, sorry, I'm stumbling, okay. strip grazing, um, uh -huh. continuous grazing or rotational grazing. So those are a more valuable research book question because that they're directly ties to the labor request or labor requirement from the producer. Right. I think... Um, you were talking about the virtual fencing and being able to see where the cattle are. I think there's probably some really valuable takeaways from there from a forage standpoint. So like if all the cattle are in the same section for a couple days, did they like, did they, it, it would be interesting. You could look at the different grasses there. Like, is there a, is there a patch of clover there? And they, the rest of the pasture is fescue or something like that. I feel like there could be some interesting ways to look at that data besides just knowing if your animals are alive or something like that and just knowing, okay, they're preferring this clover over, over this other legume. Like, I think that's really interesting from, from a, someone who as a self-proclaimed grass geek, it's uh, it's interesting to, th that could be really valuable for more than one. It has more than one method of application that technology does. That's really interesting. Absolutely. And I am, um, so that's the part of the reason I really enjoy having two departments because me being an engineer, um, my knowledge and my understanding about the forage or grass and is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. They all look like grass to me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but for an expert like you and some of my colleagues, and they, they can help me bridge the uh, knowledge silo so that I can use my expertise to help them with better understanding of what is going on with the forages and try to understand why uh, the the animals or the cattle prefer to graze this area than the others. And then we're, we're hitting some really interesting topic and probably some of the questions that producers are trying to find a answer for for a long time. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's... It's just really cool to hear. I like learning about research projects and then thinking about how they might apply to someone like myself, like out in out in the field and out in the pasture. And so that just sounds, you know, that sounds really interesting. So I, I'll be looking for more information on that as, you know, as time goes on. Absolutely. So those are just, um, I think, two or three examples of what my research is looking like. But always I'm tying to... Uh, Hopefully, <laughs> I can tie my research outcome to some useful application or potential application so that um, the producers can find that useful. They want you want it to be impactful. Well, <laughs> I try or, or trying yeah. to make myself useful. That's no, probably I, what my mom would say. No, when, no, we don't. We don't think like that here. We, you want to do things that leave a mark. And I totally respect and appreciate that. Oh, thank um, you. 
we're nearing the end of our time, but I want to make sure to, if there, if there's anything that we haven't talked about, like, is there anything that you're excited for maybe coming there and your department? We didn't really talk about Nebraska very much, but is there anything coming down the path at Nebraska or for you that you're just really excited about? Or are you pretty focused on, you know, the research projects you just shared you're very excited about? So, I mean, is there anything else in that, in that kind of area? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, I'm hoping and knock on wood that I'm committed to my word is um, I'm trying to, let's see, now that I've been in this position for almost three whole years and uh, it's about time to share some of my research um, okay. to the producers. And I have been doing some surveys about technology applications and I got really, really good feedback is producers want to access and want to understand more but then they're just trying to uh you know i think they're they're not they don't have a good avenue to access to those information so i'm trying to lead an effort um to bring some of maybe a mini expo or a mini field day and to demonstrate some of the technology that i'm doing and maybe invite some um, uh, a like-minded researchers from different states and or different species, maybe even. But I'll for sure focus on beef cattle first, and talk about virtual fencing, GPS stuff, and then some other. Um, for example, like I know that record keeping is a big. Yes, <laughs> right? yes, it is. Yes, so, it is. So, you know, instead of um, using your notebook or using your phone and have like thousands of, um, I'm using an iPhone device. So instead of having thousands of uh, iPhone notes, there are a lot of newer products can do a much better job and smarter job on that. So, you know, some kind of mini expo or field day or even uh, webinar, whatever you call that format. Um, but I, I do want it to have a effort in bringing some of those resources and available technology together and to, to introduce them to the producer. So knock on wood, <laughs> and I'm trying to, to, to roll that out maybe late this fall when um, our beef cattle producers aren't tied up with their daily chore. Yeah. Well, that sounds very exciting. Very exciting. And, and I, I, you're going to get it done. You will, you. you will get it done. You won't need love to do it. So that sounds really exciting. Um, so we, I call these, I used to call these rapid fire questions, but since I've been, I told you about them before we got on the podcast, so you'd be prepared. It's not really rapid fire. So these are just our closing questions. So we ask everybody on the, that comes on as a guest, these three questions. So the first one is what is your favorite beef related book or resource? Yeah. So I'm so glad you provided this list to me because <laughs> <laughs> this is actually the most surprising one. It got me thinking about, Oh my goodness, I need to find a book. Yeah. So, um, but actually I can, I believe the most useful resources resource for me uh, that is a book or a Bible related to beef cattle is the nutrient requirement of beef beef cattle oh. um, that was done by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and uh, Medicine. Yeah, medicine. So the reason why it is very helpful for me because, as I mentioned, that I my training was in agriculture engineering. So like my knowledge and my understanding in nutrition or uh, metabolic requirement and all those details that probably are routine discussion for my colleagues here and beef producers and students, they're totally different. So a lot of the time, if I heard a, a terminology that I don't no, then I'll just refer to that Bible and try to understand it. So by far, that is my, uh, I won't call it my favorite, <laughs> but, I think, but I think that is my uh, most useful beef well resource. Yes. yes. 
my husband has one of those for swine nutrition mm-hmm. and I bought it because he's a PhD nutritionist and I bought it for him as like a birthday present or something. It was a very romantic gift I gave him, oh but my he, really, he really liked it and he used yes. it. So that was what matters, but he yes. has one of those too. Okay. So this one was maybe easier to answer for you, but what is a book not related to the beef industry that you are currently reading or you recommend? Yeah. So, um, well, this might, it surprised me when I first read that book. So, um, a little bit long intro, but we were doing a student professional development series for the room nutrition students. And it was the first time that I read the very famous, uh, world famous selling seven habits of highly effective people. Oh yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah. I, to be quite frank, and I was not, I was pretty skeptical about all of these like success or development or professional development book until I started to read it. And I was blown away. Not only it was helpful, but it was very easy to follow. Uh, the way how the author put this together. And for a self-reflective person, I can relate to what he wrote and I try to reflect it on myself and try to improve. That really had an impact. Um, more, yes, if you haven't read it, highly, highly recommend. And I am a slow English reader because, you know, English is not my, my uh, first language. Right. But yeah. but this book I got it done in about two or three weeks. It was really easy to follow. But then it also teaches some really fundamental uh but effective communication skills so that I can better communicate with my students and my colleague and to make sure they understand what I want. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Um, You're not the first person I've heard that has highly recommended that book. So I feel like I've heard it repeated now. And so I should uh, maybe I should look into that. So I hope that our audience also will will take your advice because you gave it a very glowing book review. Um, (laughs) And then this last one, what is a trait that you admire in other people that has allowed them to be successful? Um, So the if I can rank the traits. Sure. Sure. I think um responsibility it's probably on the top the on number one of my list and then the second is self-learning and self-growth and self-reflection they're kind of all bonded together is you know like I want um I think that just gives me a lot of respect because then that means the person that I'm uh, working with or I'm dealing with always try to reflect themselves and make it better. Mm, Maybe the third one. Well, I don't think it's ranking. I think they're all important. I'm sorry. (laughs) This is your list. You don't have to apologize for your list. (laughs) And I think then the other thing I will mention is um, I, I hope I believe the people that are successful in my mind, they all have some source of grit and persistence yes. to carry the task over and finish it. Uh, so I can have a few more, but those stand on top of my list. That's a great list. The last five minutes of this interview has been a very much like a motivational speech. I've really, (laughs) it's been really good. (laughs) Um, I'm glad to hear. Yes. I mean, I've really enjoyed learning about your research and your background and and the things that you're doing there in Nebraska. But the the last bit there, you you were pumping us up with your inspirational reading recommendations and, you know, the things you find admirable. And it's great to find out things about like it's great to learn things about other people that are that are below the surface. So thank you for sharing those with us. Absolutely. That is all the questions I have for today. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Shung, for joining us on the show today. If people want to find you to contact you about your research or something like that or learn more, where can they do that? Like how can they find you or or contact you? Um, they can is email good because I I'm always responsive to emails and then like they can always find me on the website. Um, 
what's the website for the like is it the animal science department or something yeah the animal science department we could put it in the show notes okay perfect that would be great i do have one um ask for the producers you know like i'm hoping as how fast the technology world is progressing so they're gonna see more and more technology and i'm hoping that never be afraid of trying things out and also seek assistance if you want to try something out but you're not comfortable with doing it there are a lot of resources and help like me are around you so please don't let that uh fear of newer technology stop you from making all the good production and feeding the world and thank you for all they do that's great so For our listeners, that she is empowering you, if you have questions, to reach out and ask. And don't be afraid to ask for assistance. And I think that is very applicable and very valuable uh, advice. So thank you again for that. Uh, If people want to find Dr. Shrong, she is on the UNL website for Animal to Science. And we will put that in the show notes so that you can see those wherever you get your podcasts. Um, thank you, Dr. Shung, for spending uh, some time with us and talking about the things that light your fire. It was really great talking to you and getting to know you. And for our audience, thank you for being here. You can find your, you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you get those. And we will see you next week. Thank you so much.